Bom dia. Há séculos, economistas e pensadores tentam estabelecer a resposta a uma pergunta à primeira vista simples, porém intrigante, do funcionamento do mundo. Por que algumas nações se desenvolvem e acumulam riqueza, aumentando assim a qualidade de vida de seus habitantes? E por que algumas nações se mantêm na pobreza, não apresentando substancial melhora em seus índices de renda e desenvolvimento? Para responder a este questionamento, ninguém melhor que o coautor do livro Por que as nações fracassam? As origens do poder, da prosperidade e da pobreza. Com a palavra, professor James Robinson. Ok, good, great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's been a very interesting experience. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But I think uh, my task today was just to try to talk about the determinants of prosperity and poverty from uh, the perspective of my research and my book, Why Nations Fail. So if I was going to explain what Why Nations Fail was about and the nature of the explanation that we converge on about the determinants of economic success and economic failure. If I, could, if I could illustrate that with one figure or one photograph, this is what it would be. No, here, okay. So this is the Korean Peninsula at night. You see South Korea, it's very bright, and you see North Korea, it's very dark. Now, there could be different explanations for this. I think the simplest explanation, of course, at approximate level, is that all of this light in South Korea suggests that South Korea is very economically successful, economically prosperous. It had public goods, it has industry, it has light bulbs and electricity, and North Korea does not have any of those things. Now, of course, there's always different explanations for economic differences. This, this difference here, we could talk about this in many different ways. We could talk about it in terms of income per capita. We could talk about it in terms of industrialization. We could also talk about it in terms of life expectancy. Life expectancy in South Korea is much longer than in North Korea. North Korea is prone to periodic famines. Okay? So there's an enormous difference in prosperity between South Korea and North Korea. Okay? So what drove that difference in prosperity. Okay. There's, this is what the book is about. Now, of course, there's always lots of theories about economic differences. You know, my wife said, well, you know, you jump to conclusions about North versus South Korea. It could be that North Koreans just think that candlelight is more romantic. Or it could be that the North Koreans are trying to reduce their carbon footprint. You see, that's why they don't use so much electricity. Uh, but I think, you know, and one of the main reasons, you know, in economics, if you study mainstream economics and you are faced with a problem like this, you know, why is North Korea so much poorer than South Korea? Why is it that North Korea doesn't have electricity or light bulbs? You know, your first thing you do is you say, well, you know, the problem could be the economists. Maybe North Korea has terrible economists, okay? Now, It's probably true that North Korea has terrible economists. I can't name any North Korean economists off the top of my head, you know, but it could be that they came from Peru. Now, why do I mention Peru? Well, here's why I mentioned Peru. You know, this is one of my favorite examples for teaching. This is a uh, supply-side economics Peruvian style, and there was a famous book written in the 1980s by some Peruvian economists called El Peru Heterodoxo, Heterodox Peru. Okay. Now, I don't know how good your Spanish is, but if you read the caption underneath, you get, you'll see that this downward sloping, it's, a, it's an unusual type of offer curve. The downward sloping segment on the left is a situation where when the government expands aggregate demand, income expands and prices fall. How about that? Okay, only in Peru. So, so, so what happened when these economists who wrote El Peru Heterodoxo. Maybe you probably had lots of, you know, Brasileño Heterodoxo in your, over, the few, over the last few decades. What happened when the economists who wrote El Peru Heterodoxo 
took over economic policy under the government of Alan Garcia in the 1980s. Well, you know, this is what happened. Okay, so what happened was, remember what was supposed to happen was that government expands aggregate demand, income expands and prices fall. What you have here in this table, it's not very easy to see all these numbers, is that there was a very rapidly inflation took off and after two or three years there was a hyperinflation. You can see this policy was implemented 1985, 1986. By 1988, inflation was 1,700%. So prices didn't fall, actually, quite the contrary. Prices increased very rapidly, and real wages, you know, the living standards, which experienced a very transitory increase, then fell dramatically. Okay. So, so yes, you could say is a sort of example of terribly misconceived economic uh, policy of the sort that in the last section, uh, you know, you saw some examples from the current economic policy of the U.S. government, President Trump's administration, uh, were being illustrated. You know, now we have um, el gringo heterodoxo or something. So, 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 you know, so one explanation could be that North Koreans just have bad, econ bad economists. You know, and many economists sort of argue, you know, rationalize economic failure like that. But I think, you know, if we go back and we start thinking about this picture, it's sort of obvious what the explanation for this difference is, okay? South Korea has an economy uh, where there's economic freedom, there's economic opportunities, there's broad-based incentives in society, there's been enormous investment in education. This is a story of entrepreneurship, of saving, of investment, of innovation, of exporting, all the things that we know create prosperity, okay? North Korea, has had an organization, you might think that's socialist, you could call that socialist, but that's not the terminology I'm going to use, it's not the terminology we use in our book. We emphasize the fact, the basic fact that of the North Korean economy and the reason why it just generates so much poverty is that people don't have opportunities, people don't have incentives, people are controlled, they're regulated, we're going to call that a situation of extractive institutions. Okay, so you could call it socialism, but it turns out that many countries in the world today and in history have economic organization which creates poverty that have many things in common with socialism, even though they're not, socialism, not socialistic at all. Okay, so, so the big story, I think, about the difference between North Korea and South Korea is this difference between the way the economy is organized. Now, this example is particularly interesting, of course, because if we went back to 1950 or the late 1940s, this difference didn't exist, right? In fact, that line, the difference between North Korea and South Korea is a very arbitrary line that was created in the course of the Korean War, okay? Korea has a long history of cultural, linguistic uh, homogeneity, political centralization, there was no differences between the North and South in terms of economic development 60 years ago, but they were created after the Korean War when these two societies got organized in very different ways with very different patterns of economic incentives and economic opportunities. Okay. So, so, so this, is the, this is the story about Korea. Now, in the book, we don't start with Korea. We start with this picture, which is Nogales, the difference between Nogales to the right of the wall, this is the wall that runs through the middle of Nogales, uh, you know, there is already a wall here, uh, so President Trump won't have to build a new one. Uh, the, the, the wall runs right through the middle of Nogales, on the right is the United States, on the left is Nogales, uh, Mexico, and there's a big difference in living standards. You know, it's not the same as between North Korea and South Korea, but it's still pretty big, okay? So this is also an interesting example where if you've been to Nogales in the United States, it's culturally very similar to Nogales on the other side of the fence. You know, there's an enormous number of immigrants from Mexico. Uh, the food is similar, the music is similar, the, everyone speaks Spanish, uh, you know, but there's an enormous difference in prosperity to the north of the wall compared to the south of the wall. And in the first chapter of the book, we sort of say, okay, how could you understand this difference between North America and South America? Where does that come from? And I think that difference is, is deeply rooted in history, and it's a story about the emergence of very different sorts of institutions 
with very different patterns of incentives and opportunities north of the border compared to south of the border. Okay? So I'm not going to go into the historical story, but let me just tell you how we tried to illustrate this at the very end of the last chapter of the book. And the way we do that is by talking about the two richest men in the world. Well, you know, fortunes wax and wane, Warren Buffett goes up or goes down or whatever. But at least when we wrote the book, the two richest men in the world were Carlos Slim and Bill Gates. Okay? So you might think, you know, people talk a lot about inequality and the consequences of inequality. But the point here is not about inequality as such, but about how people make their money. Okay? And the way in which Carlos Slim and Bill Gates made their money tells you everything you need to know about the difference between the United States and Mexico, and more broadly between the United States and Latin America. Okay? Since the work of Robert Solo in the 1950s, economists have known that what generates economic development is innovation. Right? It's new ideas, new technology, entrepreneurship. We've been hearing a lot about entrepreneurship in this conference, and that's absolutely central to developing a society, a nation, prosperity. You know, go back to the Industrial Revolution in my own country, England. What was the Industrial Revolution about? It was about innovation. Innovation in power, the steam engine. Innovation in the mechanization of production, the factory system. Innovation in methods of transportation, the development of the railway. It was all about innovation, about new ideas, about entrepreneurship, okay? That's what Bill Gates did. How did Bill Gates made his fortune? Bill Gates made his fortune by innovating in the software industry. How did Carlos Slim make his fortune? Carlos Slim made his fortune by getting control of the telecom monopoly in Mexico. Okay? So the OECD uh, did a very conservative calculation of the costs to Mexican society of Carlos Slim's telecom monopolies. And the numbers are here in the bottom of the slide, but this is a very conservative sort of deadweight loss calculation of the costs of monopoly, what they found is that the telecom monopoly in Mexico reduced national income by far more than Carlos Slim's personal fortune. So this isn't just about taking money from the average Mexican and giving it to Carlos Slim. This is something which is actually impoverishing all Mexicans. Okay? So that's a very, very important distinction between how they made their money and, you know, yes, they're both very rich men, they're both very successful men, they're both great businessmen and entrepreneurs. But the point is, is that they were living in very different societies with very different patterns of incentives and opportunities. In the United States, the way to get very rich is to become an innovator, to become an entrepreneur. In Mexico, it's to make connections with politicians, it's to establish monopolies, to create entry barriers and rents. That's the way to get uh, rich, okay? So, you know, mentioning politicians, you might have noticed, going back to the slide of Korea, there is one, it's got a bright spot, you know, in North Korea there, which I always think is, the, you know, it's probably the presidential palace in Pyongyang. So, okay. So, Carlos Lim and Bill Gates. Now, just like the story about North Korea and South Korea, it's not a story about people or culture. The, story, the comparison of Bill Gates and Carlos Slim isn't a story about people or culture either. In fact, as we know, you know, Bill Gates wanted to be a monopolist too. Here he is in front of the antitrust authorities in, the United, in Washington, D.C., swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You know, it's in Adam Smith, you know, with all due respect to business people in the audience, you know, everybody wants to be a monopolist. You know, academics, want, we want to be intellectual monopolists. It's just a part of human nature. But the thing is, it's, just, it's difficult to create these entry barriers. It's difficult to create monopolies in the United States. There's, this scene is unimaginable in Mexico. I don't know about Brazil, but you can't imagine Carlos Slim appearing in this, uh, in this, uh, in this way in uh, Mexico. And this is a long struggle. You know, if you go back into the 19th century, this is a late 19th century uh, cartoon of uh, an octopus. Okay, what, what octopus? Well, if you look at the head, if you look at the top of the octopus, it said standard oil. This is Rockefeller's great 
you know, cartel. And you can see it's got its tentacles all around the politicians, all around the White House, all around the Capitol building. You know, Rockefeller was heavy into influencing politics, bribing senators. What happened to the Standard Oil Company? It was broken up by US antitrust authorities at the beginning of the last century. Okay, so, so this fight against monopoly, this fight against trusts, against entry barriers, this fight to keep the playing field open, it never finishes, it never ends, and it's never perfectly consummated, but it's been a lot more successful historically in the United States than it has in Mexico or Latin American countries, and obviously it's been a lot more successful in South Korea than it has in uh, North Korea. Okay, so the, we start the book with these sort of dichotomies, you know, North America versus Latin America, North Korea versus South Korea, and we sort of say, you know, what's going on here is that these societies are organized in very different ways. Some societies, South Korea, United States, have been organized in ways which create broad-based incentives and opportunities for people, that create entrepreneurship, that create innovation and technical change, that create wealth for the people and other societies aren't, okay? Now, we introduced some terminology for that, and you could think sort of so far, well, we know that, I know that. How did this guy manage to write a whole book about this? You, we know, we've known this since the 18th century. Like, what's he going on about? Okay, so hold on a second. But let me just first kind of solidify this terminology and talk a little bit more about it, okay? So, so, so as I said when I started talking about Korea, you know, you might think, oh, he's talking about capitalism versus socialism, but that's not what I'm talking about, you know. Uh, I mean, I could be, but that's a specific example of something much broader. So, so, so what we try to, what we, this distinction we make is between include, what we call inclusive economic institutions that promote broad-based incentives and opportunities and extractive economic institutions like in Mexico or in North Korea that basically place barriers to opportunity and incentives in society, okay? And the word inclusive, I think, is very, very important. And let me explain where this comes from, okay? Back to innovation and light bulbs, you know? So uh, this is uh, Thomas Ed uh, this is Edison's patent. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And when he invented the light bulb, he took out a patent. Now, a patent's a very interesting document. They were in the US Constitution uh, and the first patent board that sat in 1790 was so important that Thomas Jefferson, that was a pretty important politician, Jefferson was actually on the patent board deciding whether to grant inventors patents. Now the thing about patents is that the patent system was open for everybody. You come with an idea, you file a patent, the government protects your intellectual property rights. You know, why is that a good thing? It's a good thing because when you innovate, you generate ideas. Ideas are very easy for other people to copy, okay? So other people can get wealth from your ideas, can create wealth from your ideas. And you could say, well, that's good for society. It is, but it means that your incentives are not really aligned with the social incentives. Maybe you don't put enough effort into innovation because you can't really benefit from all the wealth that your ideas create. So the idea of the patent system is just try to push the private return and the social return together a bit. So you could come with your idea, you could pay a fee, everyone paid the same fee, you could file a patent, and the state protected your intellectual property rights. Now that's a very interesting institution. And in fact, if you look at who it was that filed patents in the 19th century, and you ask, who were these people? Who were these innovators? Who was Thomas Everson? Was he some elite? You know, did he go to University of Chicago or Harvard or something? No, you know, his father put, was a roofing contractor. You know, he was homeschooled. He, you know, he had very little formal education. He was just a brilliant guy, full of ideas and energy and creativity. And if you look at who filed patents in the United States in the 19th century, something studied by the great economic historian, Ken Sokolov, you see that, People who file patents come from all over the social spectrum. Elites, non-elites, educated people, non-educated people. I'm not, I'm not advocating non-education. I'm just saying as a fact, you know, that, that this is what happened. Artisans, farmers, professional people. Talent, ideas, creativity are spread everywhere in society. You don't know where that is. I don't know where that is. The government doesn't know where it is. So you need to create 
a set of inclusive institutions that can harness, can tap into all that latent talent in society. And that's what the US did a pretty good job of. You can always pick imperfections. Everything's gray areas. You know, I didn't mention you're sitting there thinking, okay, he's going on about how inclusive the United States was in the 19th century, but didn't they have slavery? That doesn't sound very inclusive. No, it wasn't. And the slave economy was much poorer than the rest of the, the US. The South had much less manufacturing industry, lower levels of urbanization, lower levels of public good provision, infrastructure, canals, railways. The US South was much poorer and much less innovative than the rest of the country because slavery was an extractive institution that did not create incentives or opportunities for 50% of the population, okay? So, 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 but you know, the important thing about the history of the United States is that, you know, the slave society didn't control the whole economy, okay? And you couldn't build a society based on the exploitation of indigenous people or slaves in the way you could in many other countries in the Americas. Okay, so, so inclusion, this, this idea of inclusion is very important, and I, so I wanted to dwell on this word. Okay, so, so the difference between economic success, economic failure, is this distinction between extractive economic institutions, inclusive economic institutions, and the patterns of incentives and opportunities they create. But why is it, you know, you ask yourselves, why is it that some countries have inclusive economic institutions and other countries have extractive economic institutions. Is it just the North Koreans have bad economists? I discussed that already, that the Peruvians ended up, you know, in, actually they're in the Universidad Nacional de Colombia at the moment. One of the people who wrote that book still teaches economics in the Universidad Nacional. So, you know, who knows what could happen in Colombia. We could have El Colombiano Heterodoxo in the future. But, but, but leaving aside the quality of the economists, uh, what is it that's driving these differences, okay? And this, I think, is the main focus of our book, okay? Not the economics. I think everybody in this room probably buys into this idea, you know, that um, this, is, this is the right way to think about the economics. But what creates variation in these different economic systems? That's about politics. You know, go back to my observation about light in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. How come, you know, there's light in the capital when there isn't light anywhere else? Well, because the members of the North Korean Communist Party like, they like lights, you know. Uh, they like electricity and they provide it to themselves, but they don't bother providing it to anybody else. So what lies behind these differences in economic institutions in our book, very much the emphasis on differences in politics, differences in political institutions. So what lying behind extractive political extractive economic institutions are what we call extractive political institutions. And what lies behind inclusive economic institutions is not good economists or the goodwill of some enlightened leader, it's inclusive political institutions. So, and we emphasize two dimensions of that. You know, what do you need to have inclusive political institutions? One is you need to have an effective centralized state. So a state that's capable of providing basic public goods, order, you know, uh, infrastructure, just the basic things that the state is supposed to do. The other thing you need is to have political power broadly distributed in society, okay? So when we say, in, for, to have inclusive institutions, you need both of these two things, okay? So you could think of that as being democracy, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the future of democracy. We're supposed to be talking about the future of democracy, but it's much more than democracy. You know, you can't make political power broadly distributed in the society in Sierra Leone in West Africa just by having an election, you know. So, so this, is, this, is, this is much more a process of the organization of the society, of social capital, of, you know, of, of, of what de Tocqueville saw all those years ago when he came to the United States in the 1830s. What he noticed was not the state, actually. He noticed the society, the vibrancy, the vibrancy of society, the ability of people to cooperate, to work together, to associate. And this is, you know, so th there's much more to this idea of the broad distribution of power in society than democracy, but obviously that's associated with it, okay? So, so and what do you, if either of these things fail, either the, the effective centralization of the state or the broad distribution of power, we say you have extractive political institutions. So, 
so let me not talk about that. Uh, if you want to, I'll talk about China very briefly. If you want to, I don't know if it's too nerdy, this diagram, but, but if you want to think about the whole book in a sort of nutshell, you could think of it in this diagram. So, so I don't think this is going to work very well, is it? No, it's not going to work very well. So, so remember, you know, this is very simplistic, you know, this dichotomy between rich countries and poor countries, between extractive institutions and inclusive institutions. That's very simplistic. There's a lot of gray areas in reality. And, you know, I'm an academic. We love gray areas. You know, we love balancing angels on pinheads. And, you know, so, 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 but it's very useful for developing the argument just to keep it simple. Okay? So, so, this dichotomy between economically successful and economically unsuccessful societies, North Korea, South Korea, the United States, Mexico, there, that's, that's, the, that's the difference between countries with inclusive economic institutions and extractive economic institutions. But here in this diagram, we emphasize you know, this, this combination of inclusive politics and inclusive economics. If you want to have an inclusive economy, you have to underpin it with an inclusive political system. Extractive economic institutions are always underpinned by extractive political systems. Okay? Now, you could be in you know, what uh, you'd call in linear algebra the off-diagonals, you know, with a strange combination of extractive and inclusive. Like, what do we say about that? Well, we say that extractive, extractive is very stable. You know? There's nothing about North Korea that's going to lead it to magically change. And maybe there's nothing about Brazil that's going to lead it to magically change either. But also we emphasize kind of more optimistically that countries which have inclusive institutions, also there's many feedback loops. There's many things, you know, despite the fact, uh, you know, despite what's going on now in the United States and all the talk of populism, there's many el elements of the system in the United States that keep the inclusive institutions sort of on the road. But in the off-diagonals, that's much more incoherent. Okay? So let me give you one example of the off-diagonals, which is China. Okay? So how do you think about the economic growth of China since the late 1970s in terms of this diagram? Well, China started off in the bottom right corner in the middle of the 1970s with extractive economic institutions and extractive political institutions. It was a very poor, technologically backward country. Okay? What started happening? Well, round about 1978, they started abandoning... Actually, the story is much more complicated than that, but let me just tell you the simple version of the story. They started abandoning all of these extractive economic institutions. What did they do to start with? They introduced the household responsibility system in agriculture. They deregulated prices, and they allowed individuals, individual farmers to make decisions about what to plant, where to sell it. They made people the residual claimants on their efforts. Okay? This is the most fundamental, one of the most fundamental ideas in economic theory. You make somebody the residual claimant on their effort, you allow people to benefit from the wealth that's created by their own effort, they're going to work harder. What did they do in China? They worked a lot harder. What was the consequence? A massive increase in rural productivity. So the, the, the Chinese boom is basically created by gradually dismantling all of these extractive economic institutions and replacing them with inclusive economic institutions. So that fits beautifully with the whole narrative so far. What doesn't fit so well is the fact that they still have everything run by the Communist Party. That's an extractive political institution. So what do we say about that? We say that you can't have that. You can't have a sustainable, inclusive economy underpinned by the whim of some dictators of the Chinese Communist Party. Okay? It's a train wreck waiting to happen. I don't know when the train will go off the rails, but I think the history of, you know, the world history, and there's a lot of world history in our book, suggests that, you know, concentrated political power always ends up getting abused at the expense of prosperity. Okay, so that's, we have a very negative view about China. I know China's so big and impressive, and, you know, but, but, but I think that's, that's the reality. Okay, so, so, so let me, when should I shut up? Shortly. I have this long? Ah, okay, that's good, better than I thought. All right, so, so, so let's go back to poverty, okay, since, you know, you're all depressed, and, well, you know, you're Brazilian, so you're not that depressed, right? So, 
you know, but, 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 but there's a lot of concern about the economy and about, you know, the, what's going on in Brazil. And, you know, so if I was going to take Brazil and I was going to put, you know, Brazil in one of these cells of the matrix, you know, one of these bins, I guess you'd have to say it would be in the relatively extractive bin, okay? So if you're in the extractive bin, if you have extractive institutions, how do you get out of that? Okay. Now, every country in the world, you know, even my own country, Britain, you could say, if you went back in time, they had extractive institutions. Right? So we have a chapter in the book where we talk about these institutional transitions historically in Britain, how economic institutions changed, how political institutions changed, and how that created you know, the prosperity we see in Britain today. So countries can do it. Countries have done it. All right? So, we call this, but, we, but it's difficult to do, okay? We call this the vicious circle. The vicious circle is that when you have extractive institutions, many things lead to the kind of reproduction of this extractiveness, okay? And, you know, we use here a classic piece of terminology from sociology, the so-called iron law of oligarchy. The iron law of oligarchy, you know, was a kind of anti-Marxist doctrine that was developed by Mosca and Pareto and some Italian sociologists, you know, in Marx, there's this idea that there's kind of progress in society, you know, you have feudalism and then you have capitalism and then you have socialism, this is this kind of notion of progress. And Mosca and Pareto and these Italians said, no, 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 there's no progress. You know, society's just, there's always somebody on top exploiting somebody else. And what might look like change really is just rotation of elites or circulation of elites, that's the iron law of oligarchy, you know. So, so it, was a, it was a sort of anti-Marxist idea, and I think it captures quite well what you see in many contexts of very persistent extractive institutions and persistent underdevelopment. So how can you overcome the iron law of oligarchy? How can you break out of this vicious circle and make society more inclusive? Well, I think, you know, the, uh, the argument that we have is that that's difficult because in a vicious circle, you know, the extractive institutions are so ingrained. I'll give you some examples. Here's, here's my first example. Who, who are these two gentlemen? Well, they're two Supreme Court justices in Argentina. So when President Macri came to power, President Macri defeated the Peronists. You know, he had an agenda to improve, to make the society more open, to try to dismantle many of the economic distortions that the Peronist party had put in place over the previous years. What did he do? He acted completely unconstitutionally, and he named two Supreme Court justices using decrees. Okay? As one of my Argentine friends, friends said, even the Peronists never had the courage to do that. Okay? So, of course, President Macri's justification is, is obvious. You know, well, I, I, you know, with all these Peronists in the system, I can't do anything. I can't change anything. So I need to get my own people in there. Okay? But he's thinking just like a Peronist. You, know, you can't defeat the Peronists by being a Peronist. Okay? And think of the Brazilian example. You know, when it became obvious that the Workers' Party and President Lula were bribing congressmen from other parties to support the PT, you know, people said, well, you have to break some eggs to make an omelet, you know? The PT wants to change Brazil, so they need to work with the system. But actually, it was evidence that they were being swallowed by the system, not playing the system, okay? So, so here, you know, President Macri even has a justification, but you see here, this just reproduces the whole equilibrium in Argentina reproduces the absence of an autonomous Supreme Court. Next time the Peronists come, the Peronists say, well, look, you know, he nominated these people in a completely unconstitutional way. We need to get rid of them. And, you know, so it just reproduces itself, okay? The lack of autonomy, lack of checks and balances reproduces itself. This is a, this is a very nerdy example by two Brazilian economists, uh, which is, you know, I, I could try to explain what it's about. They looked at the auditing of municipal accounts in Brazil, and this auditing for corruption. And what's interesting about this diagram is they, they're just plotting the re-election probability of mayors in municipalities which were audited before an election and which were audited after an election. And the big fact, you know, the, the big fact is that, uh, is that in municipalities that were audited before an election, 
and it was found that there were no corruption violations. The mayor, the incumbent mayor, had made was not had there were no corruption violations. The re-election probability increased dramatically compared to municipalities where there was no auditing. Why was that? Because people in Brazil expect politicians to be corrupt. They expect it to be corrupt. It's just incredibly surprising when you find a mayor is not corrupt and there's an enormous increase in the election, the re-election rate of somebody like that. So it's news. It shouldn't be news in a political system that somebody is uncorrupt. That should be the normal situation. It shouldn't be surprising news. But it is in uh, Brazil. Let me say one thing when we talk about institutions and we talk about extractive political institutions, we talk about lack of accountability, or we talk about corruption, or we talk about the fact that the Supreme Court in Argentina is not autonomous. Okay? To me, one of the things, I don't know Brazil, I've never done research in Brazil, I've worked a lot in Colombia. And if you ask me, you know, what's the major challenges with extractive institutions in Colombia? It's the, the failure of the state, the way the state works, failure of democracy, vote buying, lack of accountability, transparency, lock, you know, okay, fine. But there's also a lot of informal order in society. There's a lot of informal social norms that make it very difficult to create an inclusive society. Okay, and I just give you one example. You may know who this gentleman is. This is a very interesting man. He's called Antanas Mokas. He was a mathematician, a philosopher. He became the mayor of Bogota. And next to him is a sapo, like a toad. Okay, so he used to walk around with a stuffed toad, a sapo. So what, what, was, he, what, was, he, what was he going on about? Well, in Colombia, there's an expression, no sea sapo, don't be a toad. Okay, what does don't be a toad mean? It means keep your mouth shut. Don't mind your own business. If somebody else is doing something wrong, don't say anything. Just, just mind your own business, okay? It's not your business. So in Colombia, it's very, very common. Tax evasion, corruption. It's underpinned by social norms that say, if you see someone doing something wrong, just keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything. None of your business, okay? So, so that's just, there's many examples like that in Colombia. I'm doing some research on that at the moment, trying to understand how this influences people's behavior. I don't know Brazil or Brazilian society, but I think these informal institutions and social norms also, that's very challenging for creating an inclusive society, a different sort of society, a society based on provision of public goods, level playing field, equality of opportunity. Okay, so, so, so but you know, I mentioned history isn't destiny. Stuff happens. The world changes, you know. So how do we think about in the book? Well, think of an extractive society. How is North Korean society going to change from extractive to inclusive? It's going to change when the people who suffer under those extractive institutions, who die from starvation, who don't have electricity, get organized and change, try to change the system. Okay, this is not going to come from the benevolence of the North Korean Communist Party. Okay? It's going to come because people who suffer from the system organize. Okay? And in the book, we emphasize something we call the broad coalition. Okay? That change comes, change from extractive to inclusive come, change, change from extractive to inclusive comes when a broad coalition forms in society. A kind of coalition of the excluded, if you like, but heterogeneous with many different sorts of people and groups and agendas and, and what do we mean by that? You know, I give you an example we use in the book in the Glorious Revolution in England in 1688. So that's one of the pivotal moments in the transition towards more inclusive institutions in Britain. Okay. What was the Glorious Revolution? There was a very unpopular king called James II, and all these people wanted to get rid of him. Okay. So members of parliament, you know, landowners, workers, artisan, merchants, they wanted to get rid of James II. He was trying to create extractive institutions. He was trying to undermine the individual charters of towns, the independence of corporate bodies. He was trying to undermine the autonomy of parliament. So people got together, they started organizing. Okay? So what could they have done? Let's imagine I'm trying to, we're in some coffee shop in London and I'm trying to encourage you to join the glorious revolution. What could I do? I could say, you know, I could say, hey, 
Tiago, come with me, you know, let's get rid of James II and then we'll be in power. You know, today he's getting all the rents, but we could overthrow him and then we'll be in power, you know. Now, one of the things that people didn't like about James II was he was always intervening in legal disputes, right? So somebody, a judge made a, dis, a, a, a ruling he didn't like, he'd get rid of the judge and put another judge in. So we could say, you know, when we're in power, we'll get the, we'll get the legal decisions we like. Today he's getting the legal decisions he likes, but you know, once we're in power, we'll, we'll control the judges, we'll get the legal decisions decisions, you know. So, I, but I need to get more people involved, you know. So I come to you and I say, Eduardo, I don't know if that you're really Eduardo. No, no, that's the, that's the seat in front. Sorry, okay. But let's pretend you're called Eduardo. Eduardo, you know, come on, let's join the, join the gang. You know, we'll get rid of James II and we'll get the legal, you know. So, so I, you know, but the thing is, everybody can't have the legal decisions they like. What happens if these guys are in a dispute? I can't give favors to both of them. So, you know, what you see is that you know, as this coalition forms against James II, what you see is it's not possible to unify everybody by offering them clientelism or offering them all. You can't offer everybody favors. So, so instead they sort of say, okay, fine, let's, we provide public goods, let's do this for society, let's have that policy, let's have a level playing field, okay? We can't give favors to everybody, let's, let's have a different way of mobilizing people. Okay? And what's very interesting if you see that debate is that the ideas are very important. Okay? So ideas are very important for creating this broad coalition against James II, for unifying, giving people a unified interpretation of what the problem was in society and what they needed to do to change things. Okay? So I've run out of time and I had more things to say, but let me just finish here on this theme of ideas. Okay. If you want to create a broad coalition, if you want to move from extractive to inclusive, that's about mobilization. It's about, it's about things like this conference. It's about people getting together and talking about what's the problem in Brazilian society and coming up with an interpretation of what that problem is, what the problems are, and an agenda to change that. It's a political change, it's economic change, but it's about this process of mobilization. Okay. So, so I think that's what we emphasize, the emergence of this broad coalition with an agenda to try to improve institutions, make them more inclusive. I think the role of ideas is very important in that, and I've been really struck since I've been here in Porto Alegre at what an incredible institution this is, the IEE, this forum. You know, if I, I can't think of any other country in Latin America where this is imaginable. Okay, so that shows there really is something about Brazil. There's been some investment in education, there's a middle class, there's intellectual life, there's people questioning the way things work. In Colombia, this would become completely politicized immediately. It would just be somebody's vehicle, somebody else's vehicle, it would become personalized, it would be my people, your people. That's not what I hear. That's what I, what I hear is a discussion of ideas and principles and I think that, if you look at historically at these transitions, that's absolutely critical in unifying people behind a transition from an extractive to an inclusive society. So I congratulate you very much for the work you've done in the last 30 years. It's a remarkable achievement, and I'm going to get on the plane this afternoon with much more optimism, actually, than I had when I got off it at the weekend. All right, thank you. Okay, you're going to ask in Portuguese? Yeah. English. Oh, in English, okay. Professor Robinson, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. We'll go now to the Q&A part of our session. Uh, Professor Robinson, you state that geography does not justify the wealth or poverty of nations. To do that, you give several examples, such as the Koreas and the neighboring cities of Nogales in the US and Mexico. Uh, but what about natural resources, such as oil? Are they a, an important starting point, or a nation nowadays may go from poor to rich without the leap granted by that kind of resource? Yeah, I think, I think natural resources are good if you have them, but, but you need to have the institutions to use them in, in a socially desirable way. You know, I think if you look around the world, you see places with natural resource wealth 
you know, which have taken that wealth and created enormous prosperity. I mean, if you go back 100 years, the United States was the world's bigger, biggest exporter of petroleum, for example. You know, the United States had an enormous amount of resources historically, and they had the institutions which allowed those resources to be invested and create prosperity in society. And, you know, but look around the world today. Look at Equatorial Guinea, look at Gabon in Africa. You know, there's many, or Angola. There's many countries with enormous natural resource wealth where it's just squandered and stolen by an elite. Or look at South Korea. South Korea didn't have any natural resources at all. You know, so, so I think natural resources are good, you know, if you have the institutions to cope with them, uh, but they're not necessary for successful economic development at all. Professor Robinson, uh, you state in your book that inclusive political institutions, those in which the people have a say, are essential to the construction and maintenance of inclusive economic institutions. Recently, though, we've seen that those inclusive political institutions, also known as our most strong democracies, tend to be in favor of some dangerous policies, such as protectionism and populism. Why do you think these phenomena are happening? Is this a sign that inclusive institutions are in danger? Uh, as I said in my talk, you know, we, we sort of emphasize that once society gets organized inclusively, there's many feedback loops and processes that tend to make that persist over time. Of course, we also give examples in the book of inclusive societies that became much more extractive. You know, the example of Venice in the late Middle Ages is a famous one. So, yeah, sure, it can happen. You know, in any inclusive society, there's always an incentive to set up extractive institutions. That's the point of, you know, the Gates monopoly example, you know. So, so, so but you have to create institutional structures that stop that. So, I, you know, and I would say populism, yeah, sure. But, you know, go back to the history. You know, if you go back and you read James Madison's minutes of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, Madison completely understood populism. You know, they had populism in the 1780s in the United States. It was all over the place. And the US Constitution was designed to try to cope with populism. Okay, that's the whole point about checks and balances and the separation of powers. And so, so I, I think there's always a potential to build a populist coalition in society. But I think the institutions in the United States are strong enough to withhold that. You know, let's see. You know, I mean, you know, let's see. There's nothing sure in history. Uh, but I think this is a very different situation historically from Argentina or, or, or you know, and, and we give examples in the book comparing the United States and Argentina historically about how people have been willing to defend uh, the institutions in the United States. And in Argentina, they're never willing to defend the autonomy of the Supreme Court or the inclusive institutions. So, so, so you know, that, there's many ways to think about that, but, but I think that Yes, it's always possible that these things can go into reverse, but I still don't think it's very likely, yeah, in the United States at least. You're not very worried that the protectionism may lead to uh, uh, the development of uh, extractive uh, economic and political institutions? Well, you know, no. I'm not worried that protectionism as such can lead to more extractive institutions. I'm certainly worried about protectionism and, you know, as the, as, as, you know, as the previous panel was illustrating, you know, the current economic policy in the United States is full of, like, fallacies and misconceived ideas. But, but, but again, you know, I think that, you know, there's a lot of, there'll be a lot of problems in implementing this policy uh, from the Trump administration. So I think we're a very long way from seeing the implementation of a full-blown protectionist policy. And there's a lot of interests that are going to be jeopardized by that. And there's a lot of under people who understand that this is a very bad idea. So let's, let's hope the system works. Uh, you spoke a bit about uh, culture, Colombian culture. Um, in Brazil, we have seen many moments that should be pivotal moments in a way to more inclusive institutions. But uh, it seems we never quite get there. Uh, as a specialist in studying developing countries, uh, where do you think we have failed in the past? Well, I, you know, I think, I, think, I think Brazil, you know, like many other Latin American countries, shares this history of extractive institutions. I didn't go too much into the, you know, I didn't go too much into this history of extractive institutions, but, you know, that goes back hundreds of years. And, you know, they've reproduced themselves uh, over time. And 
that's hard to change. You know, and as I said, the, you know, one of the things which is very difficult is that you know, they get so ingrained in the way people think about the situation they're in. That's why ideas are so important. You know, like, th that's, why, that's my example of Mr. Macri. I think Mr. Macri, he's quite a well-intentioned guy, but he just thinks like the Peronists. You know, and Argentina will never change if everybody thinks like the Peronists. You have to think in a different way. You have to conceive of the problems in a different way and come up with a different solution. So, so that's, you know, that's why I emphasize ideas so much. So I think that's, you know, that's, I don't know enough about, I've never studied Brazil or done research on Brazil, but every country in Latin America I've studied in detail, you see these problems of the kind of, the mentality, it's so ingrained, people think about the problem in a particular way, they think about the challenges in a particular way, and they need to change, you know, they need to, they need to, they need to, 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 to change that. And, and, you know, that's not an easy thing, that's not an easy thing to do, but it can be done. Other societies have, have done it historically, and, you know, we do give examples of that in the book. Uh, so, so, you know, I don't have a plan for Brazil, you know. I mean, my sense is that many of these changes occur kind of slowly, gradually, cumulatively, and then you get to some tipping point and there's very dramatic change. So many people in this room, I think a lot of people have been talking about a lot of sensible policies, ideas, what should Brazil do? You know, the mayor of Sao Paulo, he's trying to improve the administration to try to create incentives for public servants to make the state work better, to make the state deliver services better, to make it more accountable. That's, that's a great change. That's a small change, but, but small changes accumulate. So, so I think what you can do is you can promote sensible, simple things, small things like that, and then you have to hope that this cumulative process uh, can get going. But, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's difficult, you know, as this example of the Workers' Party suggests. Yeah, well, we have seen some changes recently in Brazil. Uh, we actually have uh, nowadays a very wide investigation conducted by the Brazil Federal Police called uh, Car Wash Operation, Operação Lava Jato, which is exposing a wide range of corruption schemes, crony capitalism, and distortion of the electoral system. Uh, it's a sign of hope that at least yeah. some of our yeah. institutions are in check. Yes, absolutely. And what do you think, in your opinion, are the most essential institutions uh, for a country to start the path towards inclusive political institutions? Well, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I think, you know, I, I, we don't have a sort of list like that of this is what you should do first and this is what you should do next. And I think the reason we don't is that what it's feasible to do is very different in different countries. So lists like that are pretty irrelevant because they may have lots of things which are just infeasible to do in Brazil, you know. But I would say, you know, I mean, I would say, you know, if you just think about the example I just gave, you know, so the mayor of Sao Paulo, he comes, he has an agenda to change things, and, you know, so he can win political support for that agenda, and he can start implementing it. So, so I think that's very interesting, and that also shows you something about what's politically feasible in Brazil. There seems to be a lot of consensus that the state in Brazil works very badly, the state is corrupt, it lacks capacity, people don't have incentives, it's very bad at delivering services and actually doing what the government is supposed to do. So it seems like there's a, an agenda to try to reform the way the state works is important. But again, you know, I, I, I'm not really in favor of you know, creating a, a, an effective leviathan you know, that society can't control. So, so, you know, so having an agenda to reform the state that's not a very good thing unless also you can make the state more accountable. You can make it really accountable to its people. And that's not a technocratic problem, that's a political problem. It's a problem of mobilization, a problem of social mobilization, developing social capital, developing you know, new political parties and, and new agendas. And, and, and uh, so I think you know, one has to work on many margins at the same time, but I think I mean, what's politically feasible is very, very different depending on where you are in the world. Uh, speaking of the state, uh, our government tries to do everything and it ends up doing nothing really yeah. effectively. Uh, what areas do you think government should uh, uh, involve itself most and how to do it uh, effectively? Yeah, well I think that's exactly right. You know, the, 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 you know, I don't know what the Brazilian government is like, but if it's anything like the Colombian government, the Colombian government announces hundreds and hundreds of policies, you know, which it never implements. And, you know, there's no sense of prioritization. I would say, you know, 
you know, go back to my example of the light bulb. You know, why, why do I think the patent system is a good example? Because, because the patent system, you know, it's a situation where there's a clear, clear externalities. You know, there's a clear divergence between the private costs and benefits and the social costs and benefits. So I think economic theory provides a very powerful set of tools for thinking about what should the state prioritize. It should prioritize areas where there's real market failures, you know, and, 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 you know, we know where they are. Like, just think about order and crime. You know, there just seems to be a huge problem of public security in this country. You know, there's an enormous problem of education, you know. So I know there's this Bolsa Familia, and there have been these subsidies to try to encourage people to keep their kids in school. But what's, what's the impact on the quality of school, on the quality of education? People seem to think that that's terrible in Brazil. So I would think the state needs to focus on investing in a few areas where we know there's enormous externalities and consequences for society where the private sector doesn't do such a good job of aligning these private costs with and benefits with the social costs and benefits we have another question asking you to elaborate on the election of trump in the u.s uh, what's your main perce perception in uh, what is in his power to make uh, American institutions more extractive, or what institutions will stop him? Well, you know, think about, think about when President Trump came to office. What he did was he started writing these executive decrees. You know, he'd like to run the country like President Maduro runs Venezuela by just issuing decrees and never bothering with the legislative. But he can't do that. A judge immediately ruled it unconstitutional, this immigration ban. Okay, so, so, you know, what would happen in Venezuela? You know, well, you'd intimidate the judge, you'd get rid of the judge, you'd put a new, you know, you'd just, so, I think that, would, that he would love to have expanded the scope of executive, these executive orders, but he hasn't been able to do it. You know, he hasn't been able to do it. So, so I think that's, again, that's a critical test. If you go back and look at Chavez or Chavismo or the rise of Chavez, immediately presidents accumulate all of this personal decree power, okay? He hasn't been able to do it. So, so I think, you know, so, you know, there's many points of conflict and there's, you know, many, you know, and the game, you know, this is not finished yet, so I don't, you know, the, the game isn't over, you know, but I think already you've seen, you've seen kind of hopeful signs that the judiciary is autonomous and it's very difficult to intimidate, you know, the judiciary or override the decisions of the judiciary in the way that you see in Venezuela or Argentina or these other populist experiences. So, and that's because, you know, why? Go back, read James Madison. Madison said, you know, you have to let ambition counter ambition, okay? What did he mean by that? Well, you have these judges. You know, these judges, they think they're the most powerful, important people in the United States. They have massive esprit de corps. They've all had this very elite education. They don't like being insulted by politicians and told, that they're stupid or that they don't know what people want or what the constitution is. So, so you make ambition counter ambition. There's a lot of ambition in the United States society countering President Trump's ambition. That's my impression. So, so that's, you know, that's why I'm optimistic, but um, you know, watch this space, as they say. Uh, how do you see the impact of the demographic bonus in the developing countries? And in our case, uh, the loss of opportunity uh, we are experiencing. Uh, is it possible to still uh, enjoy what's left of it? Of, of the? The demographic bonus in the developing countries. Uh, Lots of people in the, entering the labor market. Um, gosh, that's not a topic I've thought very much about. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess I tend not to think that the age structure of a population is so correlated with its economic success. Um, but I guess, you know, if you want to take advantage of demographic structure, then, you know, again, that, I, that has a lot to do with, with education, with having inclusive institutions that can employ people, you know, in activities that generate wealth for the society. So I guess I haven't thought about that topic very much, but, but if I did start thinking about it, I guess I'd say the same thing I usually say. Um. Can you please elaborate on why uh, countries that develop themselves uh, by through free markets and a free economy are now going back uh, as the examples of this, the United States and France. Uh, they are 
getting more and more interventionist? Uh, is it a lack of education by people that don't uh, really grasp uh, the importance of free market, or are they being somehow manipulated by the system? I think, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, Mansa Olson, uh, the great economist Mansa Olson, sort of pointed out that, uh, you know, small organized groups of people are always able to exploit large unorganized groups of people. So, so I think, you know, what you see, you know, if you think about the example of France, you know, you have trade unionists, it's actually a very small fraction of the labor force, it's about, I think, 10% or less of the labor force are actually unionized. But they're very, very organized. You know, they're very organized. They can act collectively in an extremely you know, organized way. And that gives them immense power in society to create rents, to create entry barriers. You know, so, so, so I would say, you know, what, what do you do about that? Well, you, know, you, have to try to, you, know, you have to try to spread power in society. You, know, you have to try to counter ambition with ambition, as James Madison said. You have to create competition. You know, between these different groups, you have to try to spread power. You have to, you have to stop. You have to try to take away the instruments these people have to create rents. So I think, you know, I think there's always, as we discussed earlier, you know, there's always this struggle in any inclusive society. You know, there's always incentive to create extractive institutions in the labour market, in product markets, wherever it is. But the inclusive societies that have been successful in an enduring way have managed to create structures to create institutions that make it difficult to do that you know so but i do i do think you have you know you have a lot of straight you know japan is a very interesting example you know and france is like that too you know italy is like that you know there's a yesterday dr malan uh, kind of talked about the two brazils you know but there's the two frances and the two italys and the two japans as well right you know so so you have this one very dynamic competitive part of the economy and then you have this other very different type of part of the economy. But I think, you know, what the success of, and that's, you know, that's true in Italy, it's true in many countries, it's true in France, it's true in Japan, even, you know, very successful countries. What you have to do is create, you know, an institutional system that stops the, stops one part, uh, you know, stops the, 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 the less developed part with the more extractive institutions taking over the part with the more inclusive institutions. There's always heterogeneity. You know, think about the United States. So, and I think this rise in populism is something to do with that. You know, it has a very spatial dimension to it. You know, if you think about Britain, there's a very spatial dimension to the populism. That's true in France also. You know, it's the south of France where the National Front started becoming very successful. So I think, you know, that's something to think about also. You know, it's not just about you know, it's not just about inequality or about, you know, there's a very interesting spatial dimension to this, so, yeah. We're running, running out of time, so I'll go to the last question. Okay. Uh, if you had to start on a country with uh, extractive institutions, uh, what would be the groundwork, the framework you would uh, build on? Uh, what would you initially do to start building uh, inclusive institutions? Well, I, you know, I mean, as I said, I, you know, I think if you look at, you know, power is important. You know, power is important. Mobilization is important. And, but ideas are very uh, important for that, too, you know. So I think, you know, the type of agenda that you have here, the type of discourse, you know, you're trying to create, the type of deliberation and the type of discussion you're trying to create, I think that's very, very important. You know, I guess... There are all sorts of narratives about Brazil, about Brazil's problems, about, you know, and you need a counter, you know, you need a counter narrative. You know, it's not, I mean, yes, it's about power. It's about political power. It's about winning elections. It's about getting, you know, people into power who want to change things. But I think unifying people behind an agenda for change, that's also a kind of intellectual task. And I think that's a very important work, you know, that's being done. So this is, you know, so I, 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 you know, I, that to me seems as crucial as anything. Thank you very much, Professor Robinson. Thank you very much okay. for your presentation.